um, for the um, dispersible tablet uh, of uh, diferacerox, that is X-Jade, the recommended dose is 20 milligram per kilogram. In my practice, I don't often start the patients at that dose. Uh, I often start lower and give the patient some time and then titrate the patient up to a therapeutic dose, which ranges from 20 to 40 milligram per kilogram. So I think a lot of patients discontinue eye inculation in the first month of treatment. Uh, that is uh, largely due to the fact that they are often started at a higher dose and uh, then they experience side effects uh, and then the physicians often stop the drug. One important thing to remember is that the benefits of eye inculation in some of the large studies, particularly with regard to improvement in transfusion dependency and improvement in blood counts, they have been seen with a median of about 100 days. So it requires at least about three months of therapy to see the full benefits of uh, eye inculation of diferacerox. So prematurely stopping the drug uh, is a problem and that is often due to um, high dosing uh, to start with and also uh, lack of experience with its side effects. For example, you would expect some elevation in serum creatinine with use of the agent and that's, an, that's a known effect of the drug and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to discontinue the agent. Same thing applies to side effects like skin rash or side effects like gastrointestinal toxicity. You can sometimes improve it by taking the drug in a different, for x in a different way, uh, medium or by changing the time of the day when the drug is taken. All of these things can improve the tolerability of the drug. So the uh, experience with use of eye inculation is important to make sure that the patient is adherent uh, to, the, to the agent. One thing to remember about Jade New is that the bioavailability is more so that dosing is about 30% less for, than for X-Jade. So you have to make sure that you make the appropriate dose calculation so that you don't overdose the patient. An example of a case where uh, I have used eye inculation uh, Prior to transplantation uh, is a patient of mine who was around 30 years of, of age who had aplastic anemia from childhood and uh, she has had multiple recurrences of uh, response to immunosuppression and then has relapse and eventually developed myelodysplastic syndrome and uh, was classified as an intermediate one risk based on her IPS score uh, but was very transfusion dependent so the plan was um, made to take her to an allogenic transplant from a matched unrelated donor. But when I saw her, the uh, serum ferritin was very high. Uh, if I remember, it was around 5,000 with a very high LIC. And uh, there was no imminent risk of transformation in that patient. So we decided to chelate the patient adequately prior to proceeding to um, an allogenic transplant. And within about a year, we could bring the LIC down uh, below uh, if I remember, it was below four uh, milligrams per gram, uh, and we could take that patient to a successful allogenic transplant. Uh, so that's an example where a patient can wait uh, a little bit before we can uh, before we do the transplant. There is enough opportunity to do the chelation. Um, in th in this patient, Jadenu was well tolerated, and uh, the patient was able to take it at uh, a therapeutic dose. When we discuss uh, good examples of the uh, potential efficacy or interest of iron chelation agents, uh, one example that pops in my mind is not maybe the most classical uh, case. Um, I remember well a young lady was, uh, in fact, had transplanted years ago from a spastic syndrome, but that keeps uh, some uh, transfusion requirement after the other transplantation. Ferritin levels were pretty high, but more than just ferritin levels, uh, when we assess uh, the iron burden uh, by um, MRI, she had a pretty significant uh, iron overload, uh, not only in the liver, but also in the heart. After the initiation of uh, iron chelation therapy, we had a significant improvement of both uh, liver and heart MRI. And so the uh, liver function test abnormalities that we were thought related to graft versus OZ disease, in fact, almost completely correct with the initiation of the treatment. And what we thought to be a graft versus OZ disease was, in fact, just symptoms of the uh, iron overload uh, in this specific lady. 
So another discussion that we have uh, when we talk about iron chelation agent, and that's something sometimes uh, brought by uh, by patient is just some description of case report and some series of uh, improvement of blood counts uh, with the use of iron chelation agent out of other any potential uh, disease modifying uh, treatment. So it's pretty controversial issue, but there's some report of potential steady improvement of count over several months with the use of iron chelation uh, therapy. It has been shown as a side uh, evaluation uh, for several uh, international studies. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, around this specific question. Why is it something that's happening? Is it something real that is happening uh, from both the clinical level and the laboratory uh, science? Uh, level, but that's one of the potentially exciting uh, questions that we have uh, on uh, the subject of iron chelation agents. The use of our oral iron chelation with uh, using diferacerox or uh, desferoxamine uh, used subcutaneously uh, requires a lot of experience with the agent. So my recommendation is for uh, those physicians is to refer the patient to a center where there is expertise in uh, management of these patients, particularly with regard to iron chelation, and manage the patient together with an expert because the uh, it requires uh, significant expertise with the use of these agents to appropriately titrate the dose and manage the side effects. So I think for physicians who don't have a lot of experience with managing iron overload and iron chelation therapy, uh, if they run into difficulties with side effects or with iron overload control or any other difficulties, I think they should have a low threshold for referring to a colleague with more experience. Um, I think that this not only allows the patient to really stay on a therapeutic intervention that we think is very beneficial for them, um, but it also conveys the message to the patient that this is something that's important and that we don't you know, necessarily just stop at the first sort of bump on the road. Patients may not fully appreciate this because, as discussed before, they don't have sort of acute clinical manifestations of iron overload. It's more of a matter of developing serious complications once iron overload is significant and we want to prevent from them from getting to that point.